Welcome to episode 80 of Kyperion Commentary. As um, our listeners can tell, they also have the option of watching this conversation today. We haven't done this with a Kyperion podcast before, but since this is the this is the 80th episode, I thought I'd do something a little different than usual. You can visit us, of course, at Kyperion.com. And our goal here is always to bring authors and speakers who exemplify that Kyperion vision of bringing every field of study under the Lordship of Jesus. And our guest today, as you can see, is my old friend Gary DeMar, who's the author, who's an author and also president of American Vision, who is making available to the, um, to the world a new book entitled Against All, Position, All Opposition, Defending the Christian Worldview by uh, the late Greg Bonson. So Gary, welcome again. Good seeing you again. Yeah, my pleasure. Gary, uh, Greg seems to be the kind of man whose whose works continue to have this con this effect on modern conversations. And even though he died in 1995, uh, his message seems to be a constant injection of, of into our society, uh, a needed message in an age of subjectivism. Uh, before we talk a little bit about the book, Gary, uh, do you think that, uh, this is a personal question to you in your experience, do you think that Greg's methodology, his work in defending the faith, is finding uh, more receptivity in our day, or, or is this just uh, wishful thinking on my part? Oh, no, I, I'm on Facebook quite a bit. I use Facebook as kind of my news source, my researchers. They find stuff that I wouldn't have time to find. Uh, and I'm, I, see a, I just see so much material online, people uh, recommending uh, Greg's presuppositional model, people practicing it. I just did, a, I did a something similar to what we're doing with a fellow up in Long Island, New York. Um, he's doing a terrific job of, of, of presenting and, and explaining the position. Of course, you got, you know, Cy, uh, Ten Bruggengate uh, doing it. And you got Jeff Durbin, James White. Um, it's, it's really, really out there. I mean, Greg would be extremely pleased to see how far this is. Uh, this has gone, and uh, more writing and articles about it, uh, additional books, um, and people putting it into practice. You know, this mm -hmm. isn't just simply an academic uh, uh, kind of magic show here. I mean, people are really putting it into, in, into action, and as a result, I think the, you know, the opposition hasn't really, they, they, you know, they assume things being normative, and uh, that there's neutral language, and there's neutral uh, concepts like reason and, and uh, logic and the rest of it, morality. And the presuppositionalist goes in and says, no, we, look, we agree that there's logic and morality and, uh, and, uh, and, and laws of logic. The, the question always is, how does one account for those in a, in a matter-only evolutionary worldview? And I, I believe just like Gordon Stein was uh, stymied by Greg's comments and, uh, and position, that they're stymied as well today. They, they really can't get beyond that argument because they really don't have any basis by which, you know, they can articulate their worldview because they can't account for the, the, the operating assumptions of their worldview. Yeah, one, one of the things I've always found, I think, um, so beneficial to the presuppositional method of apologetics is just its direct applicability to the common Christian. In other words, you don't have to go back and read the great philosophical works of history or memorize a cosmological theological argument. There is something very, uh, I, I think, just, just very basic about presuppositionalism that allows for its applicability with anybody, right? Yeah, I, I, I told this story in my of a previous interview I did about, I was in, I was in Texas visiting my, my brother. He lives in Houston, Texas, and he was going he was going through a divorce and he was, you know, going to the courts and about having a, a number of different things. And anyway, I went there to give him some moral support and he was with his lawyer and my brother said, Oh, this is my, this is my younger brother. And he writes and, you know, works for a Christian ministry. And the, the lawyer said, do you believe in hell? You know, which is kind of a, kind of a strange thing as we were going to the elevator. And I called this elevator apologetics because by the time I got into the elevator, we got to the lobby, I had asked the question. I said, the issue isn't, uh, you know, what do I believe about hell? The issue is, what standard of authority are you determining whether there's a hell or not? And he was, he was stymied. He didn't know where to go with it. 
And I said, any, any doctrine it has to have a, a standard by which you determine it's, whether it's right or wrong. Same thing in law. Why is a certain law really lawful? What is, what is, the, what is the moral foundation for law? So within, within a minute, I was able to get to the essence of a, a conversation with someone, somebody without having to know a whole bunch about hell and the doctrine of hell and what, even what the Bible says about it. But just getting to the point by saying, what standard are you going to use to determine why you believe what you believe? And it, wor it, works, every, it works every time. It doesn't mean that we can remain uh, uneducated on some, of, on, on, on some of the finer points of all this. This is why this book, Against All Opposition, has got 10 chapters in it. And, and the second volume is going to have 10 chapters as well. But what Greg does in every one of those chapters he applies the same methodology throughout all of them. And you can come at this with all different kinds of angles. It's the same methodology over and over and over again uh, without, without having to memorize a book like Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Right, right. Or without having to keep up with, um, you know, technical essays on archaeology. Yeah. Uh, I think that this is, I think this is part of the, the success in any way, in, in some ways, what you mentioned earlier, is that presuppositional apologetics can be done at a technical level as the, the Bonson-Stein debate. Um, were you there for that, by the way? Uh, no, I wasn't, no. Okay, but we've all heard it, and you had uh, some, you know, intimate uh, conversations with Greg about it, I'm certain, but the, the, the ability to do apologetics both at a, a technical philosophical level as Greg's expertise, but also to make it accessible, to popularize. And I, I think Gary, I, because you've been doing this for so long, and I've been doing it for you know, at least 20 years, I think one of the needs of our day is to popularize this kind of material. The vast majority of our audience is just not going to be predisposed to reading technical works. And so this is why I'm really appreciative that you're able to do this through American Vision, making this kind of work, which is applicable. It could make a, it's, it's the elevator pitch, right? Here it is, you got three minutes, tell me about your faith, and, and here you go. So just for you real quick, Gary, you gave me a little example. You have a young Christian who is eager to defend his faith. He has been steeped in I don't know, classical apologetic methodology, whatever that is. What's your elevator pitch for presuppositional apologetics? Oh, for the classical apologist? No, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I, actually, I, I quote R.C. Sproul. It's funny because in his book, I think his book, Ideas Have Consequences, I could find it very, very, very quickly. He, he says, you know, ultimately, we do go back to, to ultimate presuppositions in order to I, make this work. He has to do it too. I, where I was, I was in the, uh, I was at the debate that uh, R.C. and Greg had at the oh. Reformed Theological Seminary. Yes. I, I, and I remember it was, it was, the place was packed. It was standing room only. I'm in the back. Uh, and, uh, I, and the one illustration I remember is that the Greg, the piece of chalk was on the, on the, on the, uh, I think, I don't know if it was a whiteboard or a blackboard at that time. But that Both matter. were prone to those methods, right? The, the right yeah. end. And so he took, he just drew a bunch of buckets, one right after yeah. another. And yeah. he said, RC, what you have here is one leaky bucket after yeah. another. <laughs> I remember that. The, the presuppositional model is there is a final bucket upon which all these other things rest, and you catch, you catch all, you catch all the water. Now you had mentioned a younger audience, and, uh, and just to kind of give you an idea for your audience as to how did you how did you get this book written? I mean, Greg's been dead for uh, you know, 25 years. Uh, we American Vision did in the 1990s uh, what were called life preparation conferences, and they were week-long conferences. And Greg was the anchor speaker for three for three of those years. And uh, and this is the second year. This this particular volume is the second year. So he was addressing high school and college students. And so while Greg could could uh, deal at the academic le uh, level. You know, you know, second to none in that particular area, he was also able to talk to high school and college students. So this book is, I believe, it's it's the best book to introduce somebody to presuppositional apologetics because it's non-technical, although there are technical things in it. But Greg explains those technical things. I, I put a glossary in it, uh, subheads, uh, study questions, 
um, uh, pull, pull, uh, pull quotes. Uh, it, it, if you want it to me, Always Ready is a very, very good book. Uh, and I wouldn't dismiss it at all. And if I'm, in fact, someone had just sent me an email by saying that I loved Always Ready, but he says it was much more difficult to read. It'd be a harder book to give to somebody who isn't philosophically minded and is kind of studying this. Against All Opposition and the second volume uh, just is, is just great for homeschoolers and anybody who's interested in apologetics. And by the way, interested in apologetics, whether it's you know the, the, the classical method or the evidential method, uh, they all borrow from the uh, all borrow from the presuppositional worldview. Yes, I, uh, I I skimmed through it for about an hour, and it is uh, very easy to read, easy on the eye, which is great. And the thing again, I keep stressing this here, but I think it's really pertinent. It's not intimidating for the Christian. A Christian at whatever stage of learning can do apologetics in a way that's faithful and consistent to his calling as. Uh, as, as a witness uh, to Christ. Uh, one of the things, Gary, that um, Greg talks a lot about is that people do not believe things because the facts demand that they believe them. Facts don't usually resolve conflicts. And I, and I think we're seeing a lot of this in our day here, where there are charts and facts ad nauseum being given to us. So what do we do when facts don't resolve modern conflicts, like uh, in our day, in our our discourse here where there's social upheaval everywhere. Where do we go when the quote brute facts don't solve emotional tensions? Yeah, in fact, one, uh, one uh, person used the illustration that um, facts don't come with information tags. Uh, you know, you, and, and, uh, and uh, Rush Dooney in his book, Myth, The Mythology of Science, um, talks about the, the, the uh, I think it was the Leakey family, husband and wife, and they came across a uh, a fossil, and they immediately, they immediately assume that that fossil fit somewhere within the evolutionary model. And, and, and Rush ex 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 describes it as almost a religious experience for them. But see, instead of waiting and say, let's, let's test this, let's go, let's, let's determine, you know, the archaeological dig and things related to it, they immediately assume that it fit their model. And there was, there was no discussion beyond that because they had adopted a worldview that was the absolute true worldview. And I, that's the way we have to go into this. Uh, and I'm not saying facts aren't necessary. Uh, some people are, in, uh, you know, are persuaded when they see something factually. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Right now here in, in Georgia, we had, a, we had a primary election. And... Uh, Already, already, the Democrats are complaining that the primary election was rigged by the Republicans because there were these long lines and the people couldn't get to the polling stations and so forth. And I'm seeing all of these, I'm seeing all of these articles online about all this. Now, if a person has an agenda, it doesn't matter what the facts are. They are going to put the worst spin on the facts as they know it. But the facts are that what happened was because of the, the, the COVID virus, they sh churches would no longer would, wouldn't allow them to use their place as a as a, uh, a polling place. Um, community centers they wouldn't do it there either. So what happened was there was this contraction of the number of polling places, and it took place within counties that were run by and this isn't to make this political, run by. Uh, those who were wanted to keep you know, the uh, the lockdown going. Now, some people will be persuaded by that. The other people won't be persuaded by that. That's I don't think that's our job. Our job is to present the operating assumptions, take the the the, the best knowledge that we can to an issue, to point those out to them. And people people do change based upon the facts. Not everybody does. Uh, we, you know, we see that in the in, in the Gospels. I mean, an empty tomb. Um, you know, the, the body is gone, and what happened? Immediately, they started making up some story about uh, you know what happened. What happened to the body? Uh, so, look, we have to understand something about unbelieving thought because we at one time were unbelieving as well. Uh, we didn't want to see the facts. 
And all of a sudden, you know, through conversion and, and transforming my eyes and my mind and so forth, I, I saw things differently. And so ultimately, this isn't, a, this isn't all just an appeal to the rational side of us, to the reason side of us. This is, a, this is a spiritual transformation that takes place in people. But at the same time, we must be very, very uh, cautious about what facts we bring to the debate. Uh, that's, that's very, very important in all this. We have to be, we have to be, um, uh, we have to be fair about the facts. Uh, thou shalt not bear false witness. Bringing false facts to a, a premise or not studying the facts, I think, is, is, is something that's, that can ruin an apologetic methodology. Right, right. And this proverb says the first thing that you hear sometimes it appears to be true until you hear the other side. And I think right. there's a, um, a, a desert of uh, the area of objectivity in our day where people are coming with very, very high emotions, which means that the, the ability to have a conversation is often going to be dismissed. Now, you talk about this in the introduction. I thought this is a very salient point because our primary, if we might phrase it this way, our proof text for apologetics is the famous 1 Peter 3.15. And a lot of people just simply overlook those additional words after verse 15. You defend the faith with gentleness and reverence. And what, what do you see? I, I tend to view this as a, a, a rather needed medicine in our day to do the apologetics ta apologetic task um, in defending the faith, but also in bringing this, uh, what, what appears to be a an almost absent virtue, which is the virtue of, of gentleness and reverence. How, how have you done this, Gary, in your work? Well, I, I have a little saying. It's, it's, anybody can steal it if they want to. <laughs> this, this, is, this is my philosophy. Don't give anyone a reason to reject your position mm. other than the position itself. Mm. Don't, don't you become the stumbling block. Mm -hmm. And I guess I've gotten to this point by... by uh, watching and observing some very bad examples over mm -hmm. the years. Uh, uh, very, very close to, to, to bad examples over the years. I won't go into who, uh -huh. they, who they are and so forth. And so I've, I've, I, learned a, I learned my lesson in, in all this. Now, it's not that, you know, sometimes I might not fly off the handle, but I have been very careful. I go on, I get very little criticism, almost no criticism on my approach. Um, and, and, and that's good. That way, you know, it's not that someone might call, not call me stupid or something or other, but no one can accuse me of attacking someone personally. Uh, and if, if, if a debate, if a debate isn't going anywhere, I just, I, I cut my losses. Um, and I think that's another, another point too. Um, uh, you can, you know, I think it's a Winston Churchill saying that, you know, if you're, if you have a particular destination and uh, if you have to, you have to throw a stone at every barking dog, you're never going to get to your destination. And so every barking dog doesn't, doesn't need a stone thrown at it. You know, just ignore the barking dogs and say, and, and, and save your, your rhetoric for people who will, will work with you and listen to you anyway on, on it. But don't give them an excuse to reject your position by, by your own personality and things you might say. Yeah, I think that's great. I did an interview with Doug Wilson a couple of weeks ago where he talked about, remember the troll that you're dialoguing with. And if this guy is a troll with two followers to his name, and he has an anonymous title to identify himself, these are the kinds of people you don't need to spend your time or waste your time with, rather. Yeah, I actually, I actually go. I, I do look at that. I look at the person. Uh, okay. Profile yeah. and I said, so helpful. Nobody's following this guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know. Don't even tell I said, Don't bother with this guy. We, we, we've given him the message, we've given, he know, he's heard it. That's mm -hmm. our responsibility. It's time to move on. Yeah, you're, you're wasting your time with somebody who, who has no desire to really listen. Yeah, yeah, Gary, just one final thing here. Uh, I have never met, uh, I never had a chance to meet uh, Greg. But it seems like my entire pastoral ministry is surrounded by Greg's best friends, and uh, I feel like I've I've known him for for a long time. Um, just because I'm really interested in the interpersonal and the dynamics of relationship, give us tell me a little a little Greg Bonson story, if you don't mind. This other fellow asked me the same thing, and uh, uh, Greg, it's interesting. 
you, you meet somebody and they're high academic standards and so forth, and you don't yeah. think that they're really kind of culturally in tune with what's going on in the world. Right, right, right. They're so focused. And both of us have met these kinds of people. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> Gary North is an, is, is an yeah. example. People just have Gary mind. North is say, but Gary North is very interesting. He and I talk about films all the time. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, he's loves you know, basketball. There was, we had a kind of a national championship basketball team and we, the, the coach was a pre, the coach who, who coached at that, that school uh, as a member of our church. And Gary said, Hey, I, I want to go to this game and so forth. Uh, you know, Gary, um, con not country music, uh, but I forget. I think it's uh, Gary's a, a big a, a music buff as well. Uh, we would talk track and field. That was my specialty. Yeah, yeah. The same kinds of guys in track and field. But, but uh, Greg, when you could talk culturally with him. And one of the things that happened in one of our conferences, Gary North got up at the conference. And uh, you know, Greg's from Southern California. And, um, uh, and, of course, Gary is. Gary is, too. And Gary made this comment about the Beach Boys never – they didn't live anywhere near the beach. It was, it was – <laughs> So anyway, we come back. We come back from lunch. Remember, this is the 1990s, yeah. and I think I think Greg had a Walkman. Now, for those of you out there who don't know what a Walkman <laughs> is, it was a precursor to the iPod, uh, but could not hold anything anything like what an iPod could have. But anyway, as the kids were coming back in, uh, Greg uh, was up there in his shorts, sandals with white socks, and kind of a Hawaiian type shirt on. And um, he, he started playing his, turned on his Walkman and took, took the microphone and put it down. It was all Beach Boy music. Uh, so he, you know, as, as tough as nails intellectually as, as Greg was, at the same time, he could, he could sit down and talk to you about all kinds, all kinds of stuff. He was, you know, sports. I think he played tennis. His kids, I know, played basketball. Uh, it was just just a really really well-rounded guy, uh, and I think you can see that in a book like this because he brings in a lot of these illustrations. That's right. From, you know, just like Jesus did in terms of people illustrations that people could understand. That's right. That's great. Well, against all opposition, defending the Christian worldview by uh, the late Greg Bonson, um, Gary. Where can these? When can our folks get a, a copy of this book? They can go to AmericanVision.org, AmericanVision.org, and just type in Against All Opposition, and it'll take you to, uh, to a page where you can order it, as well as uh, some other materials. Uh, we have lots of materials on apologetics, but this is the newest, and this is the latest from Greg Bonson. Wonderful. Always a pleasure, Gary. Lord bless you, and thanks for your time, brother. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.